back to the Dallas Arts Organization International Podcast. I'd like to take a moment to say thank you on behalf of the entire team at DOWE for helping us get to a thousand subscribers so quickly. Our analytics show that about half of our regular viewers are not subscribed. So this is a, if this applies to you, please consider subscribing. The more subscribers we have, the higher it raises our profile and allows us to attract the great guests that we've had to date and continue to have, like today's guest. John Braley founded Empty Mind Films in 2002, and since then he's produced oh, about 28 feature-length documentaries and several short films on subjects like martial arts, traditional Chinese medicine, yoga, and others. And he's done this by filming on location in China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. John's martial arts documentaries are cut above other martial arts films because John himself is a martial artist and he has an affinity for his subject and he doesn't resort to the sensationalism that we sometimes see in martial arts documentaries. If you're not familiar with Empty Mind Films, I suggest that you check them out. They're very uh, entertaining, educational, and uh, I got a chance to talk to John recently and we talked about his own martial arts journey and his directing and filmmaking process. And I hope that you enjoy this interview. If you like this type of content, please let us know in the comments section. Thanks. Enjoy. My guest today is martial artist and filmmaker John Braley of Empty Mind Films. John has made over two dozen documentaries on martial arts and related subjects. Black Belt Magazine has said of his films, the world's best martial arts documentaries. And Kendo World Magazine called John the preeminent martial arts documentary filmmaker in the world. Very so nice. if you've ever seen any of John's films, you probably agree with those statements. Uh, John, thanks for joining me today. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, Bill. Nice to be here. So let's begin at the beginning, if if we can. Um, what what got you involved in martial arts to begin with? When and where did you get involved in martial arts? Well, it was, yeah, the early 70s, for sure, in England. Um and really the start of a martial arts boom, you would call it, you know. Um, plus, if, if, if you take that time frame, the early 70s, and then you take my situation of where I, you know, grew up in England, which was the north of England in a very working class, uh, pretty tough neighborhood. Yeah. A very tough neighborhood. Uh, skinhead gangs, <laughs> bullying fights in the local pubs. I mean, you know, it just was never ending. And yeah. uh, so I tried boxing when I was about 15 years old. Uh, didn't really like it very much. Um, and then, you know, Bruce Lee happened really, I guess in the early 70s, 71. Uh, I went to see the big boss as one of his first movies. And around about that time, uh, as well, you know, the Kung Fu series was on television. And I started looking around maybe for karate, you know. Uh, and it was in the early days the Japanese was starting to come over to England. Great Japanese instructors and dojos were really opening up everywhere. Um, and my older brother, five years older, was in a band. Everybody was in a band. In those days, you know, the height of the 71 was the height, height of music in England, the, right. just after the Beatles. So my brother's bank manager, I still remember his name, Keith Wagstaff, uh, came to our house. And to me, it looked like James Bond, this guy. Yeah. I mean, it was probably only 25, 28 years old, but and he was a black belt in Shodokan. I couldn't believe it. And uh, so he, I had no money in those days. I was a poor kid. I had no father. Uh, we had, my mother was had five children. So we, we were really, at the, we were government welfare. I mean, yeah. it was simple as that, really poor. And he took me to the YMCA on a Tuesday nights and started teaching me karate, you know. And um, that lasted about eight months. Uh, and then he could no longer teach me, you know, uh, all good things come to an end. Yeah, he had, uh, he was moving cities. So, and it, but he, he did a great favor. He, he took me down to a Shurikan Karate Club and joined me, introduced me to the instructor. 
and uh, which made me feel more. I was very shy when I was 17, 16 years old, you know, yeah. coming from that kind of background, uh, really shy. And uh, he, he joined me up and it was from there, it just boom, took off. You know, the guys were great. The karate club was um, run by Roy Stano, who, who uh, was was quite a legendary karate instructor in those days. Uh, I think today still, I think he's he runs uh, one of the large karate associations in the UK. He's head of the um, British, uh, you know, karate association or whatever label. They keep changing labels and right. things, but. Um, so he's still around, and um, and that was great, you know. And the, um, it was a big, big dojo. The dojo was in a part of a church in those days, uh, what we call a vestry hall. Yeah. And uh, my first job was to hammer the nails down in the floor so they didn't catch people's feet, you know, and things yeah. like this. And there was a corner where the rain came through the roof, so nobody trained near that. It was it was incredible, you know. Yeah, those are great training environments. I, I had a, a similar experience myself when my first dojo was like that. It was in an old school building, an abandoned school building, so no yeah. heat, you know, broken windows. Oh, all. absolutely, yeah, yeah. But you, you miss so, those times when you get older. You know, you look back on that kind of fondly. Yeah, yeah, certainly. That was uh, Cemetery Road. I still remember in Sheffield, and uh, there were great times. And uh, you know, you know, being so shy, and we talk about this a lot in martial arts about you know, things that affect your life, uh, the mentoring and the people you meet when you're very young, which stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, I was uh, doing pretty well at karate. I, I never missed a class, four classes a week, uh, tough, tough training. These guys, you know, there, there was um, at that time a dojo in Liverpool, the Liverpool Triangle, the Red Triangle, which was infamous. And one or two of the black belts from our club would go over there to train and they would come back with all these, you know, legend tales of the training and it, it, it sort of pushed us quite a bit. And, but I do remember one day, uh, one of the black belts came up and he said, uh, are you coming across the road? And I said, what, what's this? And he said, to the pub. Come and have a, a beer. And it was, for me, one of the most significant things that happened at that period to yeah. be, you know, for a black belt. You we hardly ever talked to the black belt socially. Yeah. You know, they yeah. would, and uh, took me into the pub with, there was like five or six black belts, a few brown, and we, it was changed my life. Yeah. Huge that boost of self esteem. Yeah, totally. I went from no self-esteem to appear within a short period of time, you know, confidence at an all-time high, you know. Yeah. So, and I think <clears throat> that still, it works today a little, but not so much because, you know, things have changed rapidly in, in uh, today's, uh, you know, 40, 50 years later, you know, it's a very different social situation, yeah. you know. Yeah. But those days, it was very important. Very important things like that. Yeah, I think it depends on the environment you come from. A lot of times, sure. when you that working class um, environment, things like that mean a lot more to you than they might from somebody who's who's used to having a you know an easier life. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and it and it and it goes past the dojo. It goes into <clears throat> my school work performed better. You yeah. know, um, I was through confidence and just being able to talk to adults better, teachers better. Um, I, I got out of my situation. I became an architect. Yeah. You know, I moved across town, you know, to a neighborhood where there were no gangs, you know, it's yeah. pretty amazing. And, and I put quite a lot of that to the, you know, friendships through, through martial arts, you know, it, it is, trans it is transformative. And I think that's one of the things that people miss about these traditional arts is that, you know, yes, they, they are for self-defense and they can be used for self-defense, but in a broader sense, they're for improving and protecting aspects of your life that that are not you know, yeah. so concrete and physical. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, if you look at Japanese martial arts, and you look at um, many years later when I was able to 
you know, travel to Japan a lot. If you look at the uh, Budo Association and you look at the handbook, when it talks about the sort of precepts or concepts of martial arts of Budo, the yeah. first one is, it is for the development of the character. They, right. In fact, in, in the 10 precepts, they never mention fighting or self-defense once, right. Right. you know, so development of the character. Yeah, you know? that's, that's the true value of it. Mm -hmm. So did you continue to study karate for the rest of the time that you were in England or did you practice other arts as well? Um, <clears throat> no, it's interesting. <clears throat> in those days, um, we were really, especially the, the big influx of martial arts that was happening in England in the early 70s, there was <clears throat> some very dubious <laughs> yeah. martial arts schools opening up, you know, and uh, especially Chinese with the Chinese influence, the Bruce Lee influence especially. And... Uh, um, so it was really more about finding a good instructor in my, not so much the style or, or even whether it was Japanese or Chinese, but, you know, get a good instructor. So we would travel quite a bit if we could at the weekend. We would go over to Manchester. There was an instructor called Danny Connor, who was legendary. I mean, he was the real deal. He had a, um, a magazine called Karate and Oriental Arts. He had a small shop in Manchester. And um, so he was very, very good. We would travel to uh, Liverpool to be those guys, which was Andy Sherry and O'Neill Brennan and Frank Brennan. These were really the, the very high end of karate in England, those guys. So it was about this, the, the instructor. And when I um, just, when I got my black belt, um, I met a Tai Chi instructor. So I was interested in almost all martial arts. And I met the Tai Chi instructor through a friend of mine who was uh, a college teacher. And uh, he said, you should come to our, there's a Tai Chi instructor um, in Sheffield called David Barrow. So I, I went along and uh, started Tai Chi from that day. He was yeah. fantastic. And I think it's all about, you know, the teacher, the, the how they teach. It still is. I, I, I yeah. mean, you know, you can be as good as, as as anyone technically, but if you can't teach, it's, you know, what's the point? You, you know, you you have to be able to teach. And David Barrow was was a really great teacher. And um, he was a milkman, you know, delivering yeah. milk in the morning. So consequently, he, he used to get up around four in the four a.m., deliver the milk, and then start Tai Chi early mornings. You know, and um, it was it was really nice, and um, so it was Wu style Tai Chi, and uh, he, 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 he when he could, he brought his um, instructor over from uh, China or well, from Malaysia and Hong Kong. His instructor. I still have. Let me see if I have a book here. Picture of me when I was twenty. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Picture. So that's yeah. I'm around twenty one years old. Then and this is probably around about pretty skinny. I, I that's probably about three months after I got my black belt and I switched to Tai Chi and I, I really didn't go back to karate for about two years. So I did Tai Chi with David Barrow for about eighteen months. Um, I really loved it. It was great. And funnily enough, uh, a, about a year ago, I um, I uh, produced a book on interviews with Tai Chi masters. And I decided to find David Barrow. And he's in England, risen to the very top as he should. He's, you know, the head of a large Tai Chi association and a great person, great instructor. That's so right. it's nice to talk to him again. And and in fact, I, I did a commemoration in the book, acknowledgement of, uh, you know, of David. So somewhere in the book, <laughs> said to my instructor, Very nice. David. So, so it's, it's great that you can still connect after, you know, sort of 40, 40, 50 years, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Beginning, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that you went into uh, architecture. 
Uh, did, mm-hmm. you, did you have any inkling at all at that point that you would eventually end up uh, making films or was that something that wasn't even in your in your mind? Well, I started at art college. So I was doing photography anyway. And um, part of the course at art college, I was always drawn to art. I was painting when I was very young, won some art competitions when I was about 12 years old. And um, I went to art college, um, started, I was doing photography. I joined the local photography um, society in England, which was funnily enough, the, the, at the YMCA once a week, the same place I started uh, karate. And um, of course, there was no filming or, you know, there was no video in those days. Uh, and, and certainly filming was something you did in Hollywood, you know, it's, you know, there's really nothing I thought about. Uh, but I did get a good base. I, I was doing photography, actually almost semi-professional as well when I was very young. I was doing, a, as I said, in England, the music is very important. I was doing album covers wow. for musicians, local wow. musicians in, in my own town. And so I, I did a couple of album, few album covers and um, photography was one of my side hustles, yeah. if you call it, you know. And um, then, no, so then I, you know, I I switched from art college to architecture simply because everybody told me you, you'll you never earn a living, you know, uh, being a painter or a photographer. Um, and um, so that was that. And it uh, took me quite a few years, became an architect. And uh, so that, and then, you know, I was in England for the next very comfortable life in England until about 1989, I would say. I would be in my 30s, early 30s, and um, moved to New York. That was it. Your architecture career took you to New York? Not really. I mean, oh. yes, I, I went to New York and had a couple of uh, people uh, that were recommended to go and see, and they gave me work immediately, you know. And uh, but But it was very different. And but I did discover that photographers in America get paid. Yeah, you know they they're, yeah. they're almost celebrity cat, whereas you know not the same uh, in other places. And uh, so that was interesting. So I took up photography again, and uh, and then it wasn't until I moved out of New York that I started. It was in the early days of multimedia, you know, yeah. sort of the early nineties, and that really was a big influence because now you could start editing videos, you know, on a computer at home. Right. It was pretty, pretty impressive. So that was really the start of it. And then in 97, I made my first documentary, which was not martial arts. That was um, about uh, a friend, a friend of mine came to me who was actually from the music industry. uh, And uh, he said, I want to do a documentary. And I said, okay, I, I could help. We could do it together. We did. And it was on a, it was about a uh, Russian Olympic coach who had, who had created a revolutionary running method. Mm. And in fact, he, he, he became uh, quite recognized for, you know, what he did. And uh, some Olympic teams started using his, his method of running. Uh, the USA triathlon team adopted it. So, and a lot of, of course, a lot of the Russian athletes adopted it uh, until the government told them to stop because uh, this coach um, left Russia ah. and moved, <laughs> moved to Florida, mm. and so the the and uh, the Russian Olympic uh, uh, you know organization really were upset by that. So we made a documentary on him, which was a lot of fun, really great, and that took a couple of years, and then in. About a year later, I started to think of seriously about making a documentary in on martial arts that was not in the late nineties. Yeah, yeah. So, could you talk a little, bit, a little bit about the process for your first martial arts documentary? Um, how did you pick your subject, and 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 mm-hmm. how did you move forward from there, from the initial idea? The initial idea, well. There was there were one or two documentaries coming out of martial arts at that time that were really awful. Yes. 
they they were portraying martial art. They they were picking the little best pieces yeah. of martial arts and giving clearly the wrong impression of what it is like to train in martial arts. You know, you you're not automatically Jet Li, you know, jumping around uh, uh, and. Uh, you know, uh, if, if you're doing Kung Fu, you're not outside a beautiful temple on a beautiful spring day. It's not like that. Right. Uh, Japan especially, you know, uh, training in Japan is not like that at all. And most of the top martial arts uh, instructors are really shy. They don't, they're not, you know, they're humble. They, they don't sort of, uh, they don't market themselves. Right. Uh, like they do today, for example, some of them, you know, some are pretty shameless. <laughs> but um, so my idea was to show a documentary that really took you into the dojo, the training halls in China, the dojos of Japan. Talk to the number one. Don't get sidetracked by someone who claims they're the top instructor. You know, at that time, I remember there was a discovery, uh, a new cable TV was opening up in America, cable television, and the Discovery Channel showed a documentary of, you know, this sort of uh, glorified martial arts, if you can say that, you know, a uh, sort of death touch right. martial arts that were from, you know, two feet distance with the hands and the, the guy would fly back. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I could name names, but I will not. Yeah. I will not. But uh, you know who they are. And I was appalled. You know, I said, this is just, the public's watching this, and this is just absolutely yeah. awful. Yeah. They don't understand what the real training is like, how, how hard it is uh, just to train day after day. Yeah. You know, thousand punches yeah. in the dojo. The next day you go back to do a thousand kicks. You know, this is Japanese way, you know, oh, just, yeah. and if you leave, you leave. They didn't care, the Japanese, you know, it's, you know, the, and uh, so we. I decided to do uh, the first movie, The Empty Mind, was really a connection between J Japanese martial arts and Chinese. It wasn't, a, at the beginning, supposed to be like that. I My background was Japanese martial arts and karate and uh, and to a certain extent, I did Aikido. I had a year's training in Aikido and uh, related content. But so, but when I started to look at the documentary, it, it would be impossible without really showing Chinese martial arts, I thought. You know, I, I really need to look at Chinese martial arts as well, even if maybe I don't include them in the original movie. So... Oh. So the trip started to be Japan, China, Japan, China for about two years. And what happened during that time we were filming was that I realized when you were talking to a Japanese sensei in a dojo, it didn't matter whether it was really karate or kendo or aikido. And then you would look at an interview in China at the Shaolin Temple, for example, or in Beijing, or internal martial art, or Kung Fu, they were literally talking about this. You could almost cut from one to the other and finish yeah. the sentence. Yeah. They were that much closer than even I realized at that time, you know. So that was the idea, it quickly became for the first movie. Okay, let's connect the two together. They are so, they're more similar than what we can think, you know. And that's what we did. The Empty Mind was really an exploration of regular day-to-day -day training. Nothing, you know, uh, re it was real as possible. Yeah. Nothing set up. You know, I in fact, when I went to um, China, a lot of the Kung Fu masters would try to set things up. If you under, you know, I got, please, right. please, no. Yeah. Let me film a regular class. You know, let me, and they were surprised. They said, really? I said, yeah. You know, I, I, you know, please let me show a regular class, you know, and this kind of thing. So that was really good. I mean, the Japanese are the very opposite. Right. You know, they, um, they don't, they don't bother with, they, okay, come to the dojo and, 
you know, regular class. Here we are. This is what we do, you know, nothing fancy. I, I mean, I remember it was just a year or two after the JKA split up into two big organiza uh, uh, karate organizations. And so I decided, well, I need to film uh, uh, this instructor, Masao Kagawa, who was one of the top instructors at the JKA, who split away and um, they were now the JKS. So, uh, the, so there was this competition, competitiveness, you know? And when I was making the appointment for the interviews, they, uh, the Masao Kagawa's uh, uh, assistant asked me, have you filmed at the JKA? Japan Karadius. I said, yes, we've already filmed there. Who did you go to see? I said, oh, we went to see Tanaka Sensei, who was legendary yeah. world champion karate instructor. And they said, oh, okay. He said, yeah, yeah, well, you can come to, uh, you know, visit with uh, Kagawa. And I said, please, just a regular class, you know. Now at the JKA, we filmed the, set, the instructor's class. Yeah on a Saturday, which is a special class only for instructors. So along we go to the JKS dojo, very humble dojo, you know, in the Northern Tokyo suburb. And Kagawa was teaching a children's class, just kids with the mother sat around the yeah. corner. And that really taught me a lesson yeah. in martial that you, you, see, you get these lessons all the time. Yeah. You know, these things that you go, wow. This is really interesting. Yeah. One of the top karate instructors for me, technically at that time, I think Kagawa was technically the best karate, uh, you know, sensei in, in Japan. And here he is knowing that he's going to be in a documentary alongside JKA and Kanazawa, who was uh, teaching with the SKIF and all these other instructors. And he, he decided to... Uh, yeah, come to the children's class. Yeah, <laughs> very nice. Very humbling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're right. So the kind of people fun. they are. Yeah. No ego. I've, yeah, I've had those experiences. Well, I I, uh, I actually started in Chinese martial arts and then j did Japanese martial arts for a long time and then went back to Chinese martial arts. And um, they do have different approaches. But as you said, there's a, there's a connection there, obviously. You know, a lot of these arts originated in China and migrated to Japan, yeah. things like that. Um. But uh, no, I, I I really, you know, even though we're just kind of in the middle of the interview here, I do want to take this opportunity to thank you for making these films because of what you said earlier. There, there are just not a lot of good quality martial arts documentaries out there. Yeah. They mm -hmm. give the public the wrong idea. And right. you know, it's yeah. embarrassing to watch if you're a martial artist. Yeah. So um, I, I yeah. really appreciate your contribution in that respect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, well, so, bringing up that point, I'm sorry to interrupt, but go right ahead. We, we can talk, we don't necessarily want to do it now, but we can talk about what's happening with martial arts in China and then maybe Japan to a certain extent, but what's happening today, yeah. you know, with, yeah. with uh, Shaolin Temple and all yeah. the other stuff. Yeah, I would definitely like to talk about that here in just a yeah. minute. But when yeah. you, were, you were making the original film, The Empty Mind, um, yeah. did you kind of know during that process that you were that, that you weren't finished, that you were going to start making other documentaries to follow? No, that's... Interesting, because it, it it took quite a bit of work, that first document. I had to learn about filmmaking. So I went to New York to buy the camera, expensive camera from, it was a new camera. It was the first video camera that could shoot 24p. I don't know if you, 24 frames, which was uh, 25 years ago. It was quite something. The video, even though it was a standard definition, it looked like, it looked like movie footage. Right. It didn't have that sort of video. So I bought that camera and the camera was expensive, but they explained to me that I get a seven day training course in Hella in Los Angeles with yeah. it. Wow. I just have to get my, you know, fly there right. and, you know, get a motel, which I did. I got the cheapest motel near the, near the uh, Warner Brothers film studio. And every day I went there. So I, I learned the craft, you know, and learned filmmaking, and I studied on my own quite a bit. So it was a learning curve, for sure. Um, I had to get, my Japanese is, was non-existent at that time. So uh, I got a Japanese translator in Miami, which is really difficult. There's no Japanese population down here uh, where I was living at the time. 
So we would we would be at my apartment at sort of midnight calling Japan, you know, or tech or faxing them. That in those days it was fax machines. Uh, so it was difficult to set up. And so af after the Empty Mind movie, which did well, I mean, we won some, you know, we did some, we did the film festival circuit, and you know that was fun and interesting. But it wasn't, you know, I never made intended it to be a commercial uh, venture. You know, it was never set out to make money. Uh, but I didn't think about doing any more martial arts movies, no. And then, but I was always interested in Zen. Zen meditation. I thought, I thought that the mental aspect of martial art was so overlooked, so overlooked. Uh, 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 what happens to the mind, you know? Uh, not just in everyday things, but, you know, what happens to the mind when you really want to train, you know, uh, in meditation? Because it, it is training, you know, you don't just, you know, sit on a, right. you know, sit, you know, near, you know, sit, sit cross-legged on the floor and close your eyes. It's ridiculous to think that you can, you know, right. you have to be trained. And uh, so we did a, we, in uh, 2004, I was in Japan again filming Zen Meditate, which is very difficult. I was so naive in those days. How do you film Zen? Right. You know, it was so, so ridiculous. But I storyboarded it. You know, I was an artist. So what I did, I got some really nice uh, paper and I cut it into squares and I storyboarded all the chapters, you know, and I did that. And, uh, you know, and I stood by those. I Xeroxed them into and I took them with me. I said, OK, we've got to get this footage. Okay, and people thought, why, why are we filming fish in a pond swimming by? Well, you don't understand. The water is the the vehicle, you know, the carrier, and it's mo mo you know, and all this. And oh my god, you know, but you know, yeah. we did it. We made a movie, and and believe it or not, that was much bigger than the Empty Mind, especially in some countries. I still don't. And Germany's fascination with Zen has no end. Is that right? Yeah. I'm still selling that movie today in Germany every week. Wow. It's, it's fascinating. Right. I think maybe the Zen in the Art of Archery had some, you ah. know, that was the, the you know, Herigel and the German connection there had some influence, big influence, I think. But certainly, and, and in fact, when I was going, you know, going to some of the Zen, Zen dojos, some mm -hmm. of the Zen monks, there were quite a number of Germans there studying Zen. And, and Zen Buddhism and so, so it's fascinating. So that was the second movie. And then, so I still didn't really think much about doing a third movie in, uh, which would be martial arts, but what happened, a significant thing happened. I was, as, as I said before, doing multimedia and I was involved in publishing and all sorts of things. And because of my uh, sort of Asian fascination with Asia uh, and, and I aligned with the culture, I was asked by the Chinese government to uh, come to Beijing uh, for six months, or five months, and help them redesign their national publications media. Wow. This was, in, yeah. And what the reason being that the Olympics was, Beijing Olympics was coming up in 2008. So there I was in 2000, 2007, working in this huge company that was a half-owned publishing group, half-owned by the Chinese government, redesigning all their English-speaking uh, publications and newspapers, and one being a communist uh, newspaper that was you know, specifically uh, published by the Chinese Communist Party. So I redesigned it to make it look much nicer and readable to the people who would be coming to uh, China in, you know, for the Olympics. And so during that period, they assigned me an assistant who spoke perfect English. She could write perfect English, speak. She was from uh, Peking University in Beijing, which is a little bit like Harvard or Cambridge, right. you know. And she, uh, she was be Betty. And I said to Betty, I'm thinking of uh, making a movie. And it was the 
World Wushu Championships in Beijing, and Jet Li was the uh, sort of, uh, uh, what could you say, the um, guest guest of honor. So during that period, so we went over. She, as a journalist, she was an accredited journalist. She got me in, in you know, in there, in front of Jet Li. Very nice. And yeah. So she became my assistant for the next 12 years and a full-time assistant. Wow. So after that, I moved to Beijing. Um, in a didn't literally move overnight, but over, over the next couple of years, you know, and I ended up uh, in Beijing for about four years living there from about 2010. So 2000. So that was how it happened. And I, I made a couple of, I made uh, Masters of Heaven and Earth 2009, which was predominant, which was Tai Chi, movie on Tai Chi. Before that, I made a general movie, Warriors of China, which was, you know, all the martial arts, an overview of yeah. all the martial arts, in China, most of them, you know, Shaolin, Wudan, we went to Chen Village, Beijing, martial arts, Bagua, all yeah. this, you know, Xing Yi, you know, all this kind of thing, you know, so... So we made a couple of movies in China at that period. And then 2010, there was a young boy. Young boy, his father came to me, Ken, Ken Magno, and said, look, my boy's moving to Shaolin Temple. I said, how old is he? And he said, hey, he's eight years old. I said, what? He says, yeah, he's been accepted into Shaolin with the Chinese, I said, oh, is he at one of those English schools that surround? No, right. no, he's at the temple. He's, he's right there next to the Shaolin. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. So I went to meet him in Florida and all that. And, he, and he, I thought he was a crackpot. Yeah. You, know, the, you know, I thought he's sending his eight-year-olds. And I said, what about, they were from uh, um, by, by, by Phoenix, Arizona. And I said, what are you doing with your, your work and your family? He says, well, I'm going to live at Shaolin Temple uh, uh, with him and, and we find accommodation there. And uh, and uh, my wife and I will have to live apart. This is, I got, and he said, would you like to make a movie? <laughs> because, and he'd been approached by television in Colorado and uh, LA and people and filmmakers to document this, but he saw, you know, some of the work I was doing. He liked the fact that it was not sensationalized, you know, that we just, you know, show how it really is. So, so that's what we did. And that was one of the reasons I began living in China as well, because I would have to document this young boy, you know, almost every couple of months, be at Shaolin, you know, go down to Shaolin Temple, stuff like this. So, and so we made a Shaolin, a Shaolin, a Shaolin kid. Yeah. That took three or four years of filming, yeah. Wow. It was interesting, yeah. So I mentioned when you made Warriors of China, like you mentioned, there's, you know, several different martial arts featured in that yeah. film. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you'd heard of most of these, but it, was this your first exposure to some martial arts, like Ichuan, for instance? You, you did a, a segment on Ichuan. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's very interesting. interesting. Have you ever seen that before, or did you know anything nope. about it before? Yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, because... You know, it's, you know, it's got ties into, you know, some of the internal art, martial arts, of course, mm -hmm. but, you know, Baguan and Xing Yi and everything, you know, and especially Xing Yi. But um, no, and, and I went up to see uh, Hui Rubin, which is this, uh, and it was about, oh my God, it was about an hour or two north of Beijing. We went to this place, middle of nowhere, this tiny little village. And and uh, my 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 assistant Betty was fantastic. She she was just so good. I, I could not have done anything of this without you know Betty. And uh, all credit to her. And um, so we we went to yeah Yi, Yi Tuan and and it, it's so we were there and uh, it was it was I, I, I for me it was tough to understand what was happening. Yeah, you know. Uh, not fully immersed in the internal arts, but like, you know, and, and no background in uh, sort of, except, you know, a couple of years, Tai Chi, which is very different, very yeah. different. And um, 
so the exposure to that was very interesting, uh, uh, how they were training uh, this uh, sort of uh, action without action, this this mind intention, you know, for, uh, of, of aspect. And um, so, yeah, that that we that's why we left that till the very end of the it's it's the last segment at the end of the movie, because to put that at the beginning would have been uh, what yeah. the hell, you know? So we wanted people to go through 60 or 70 minutes first to right. see all the broad groups. And then the Yi Chuan at the, was at the end, you know, and um, and that really uh, re uh, last year I was approached by a German university if I could write a paper on yeah. that. On that visit. Yeah. They were so they said this is one of the topics we we find no one that can talk about it. Can you talk about your visit? So we printed the full uh, unedited interview there. You know, and created this paper for them. You know, yeah, I've read it's really fascinating. Has been has been read at many many seminars apparently across Germany. Yeah. So they still right. contact me about this YouTube. <laughs> so it was a really fascinating segment because, um, you know, if you'd never seen that before and you just walked into a, a courtyard mm. with people standing around holding these postures, you know, for yeah. hours on end, you you you'd think, you know, it sounds like you're in the middle of a surrealist movie or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, sure. And you know what's interested? You've you've only got seventy five minutes. Of, if that's a long movie, that's a long yeah. documentary. And but to show someone standing there for one hour, how do I show that? I, you know, you know, how long do I cut? Say cut. That's enough. You know, because you can't show it in a short movie. That that they would stand there for hours and then slowly start moving. Slowly, I was like, oh my god, you know. And um, but I mean, I was already obviously used to the you know standing med standing pole meditation, which you see quite a lot of in uh, some of the uh, schools, especially you know Wudang Mountain and, and even Shaolin Temple. Uh, 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 but you know, sort of you know stood there, but they don't stand there for one hour, you know. Right. Um. So that was interesting. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about Wudang for just a minute because I know you did quite a bit of filming there uh, yeah. with Zhang Yunlong who's a, you know, a teacher there. Could you talk a little bit about how you came to Wudong the first time? And um, your Yeah, family? very tough. Uh, I went to Wudong because I wanted to see, go there. Uh, I mean, of course, to film the martial arts, but, and to film Wudong Tai Chi. But, you know, just, I like the, I, I like, I like mountains. Yeah, you know, sure. uh, I, I think everybody loves mountains. They love to go up, you know, got peaks. And, but, it, you know, in those, I went to Wudang, it was probably 26, 27 years ago now, but uh, the year, it was one of the first places I went when I did Empty Mind. But, and and it's, uh, and I, I went there in about the year 2001. And it was nothing like it is today. When I got there, there was just one, road that went up to the peaks and it was sort of clay hard clay there was no tarmac no nothing you know and when i arrived there um at the entrance to it that they they, they they we could not go up the road had collapsed near the peak and i'm we finally we got a a, a lift in fact I, I think i put this in the movie shooting from the window of a truck going at Wudang, it was so frightening because this truck was, you know, delivering uh, concrete, you know, to shore up the road. Yeah. So they're de delivering concrete and it was about two feet away from the edge. And there was no barriers in those yeah. days to the valley below, you know, it, it was insane. And uh, we got up there, managed to walk around the whole, the, the road had collapsed. So we were going to the purple... Uh, Purple Heaven Temple to film Tai Chi, yeah, to meet Master Yuan, who we filmed much later. We and we kept visiting Mudang, kept going back because I think it's a fantastic place. I really do. It's it's it was more mystical then. It, it's lost some of its charm, yeah, uh, which has also happened to Shaolin, for example. 
uh, we're going to go get back to that thing of what's happening with those places. But at that time, 20 years ago, I could just see the beginnings of what I call Kung Fu tourism, you know. And um, I'm glad that I made a movie before that happened. You know, The Empty Mind's first visit to Wudai. And then the second visit, which was Masters of, Masters of uh, Heaven and Earth which was 2007, I think, 2008. Then it all fell to pieces. But yeah. Zhang Yunlong, you know, the master Zhang Yunlong, priest Zhang Yunlong, was really an amazing person to me. The real deal, as I would call it. His knowledge is just never-ending knowledge, you know. Yeah, he spent quite a long time trying to sort of piece back together uh different arts to, to bring there to the mountain to teach to people mm. I, I think he got started when he was a teenager actually traveling around china and talking to yeah. the old masters and, and getting them to come mm. back to the mountain to to teach yeah, young young. preserve yeah. this yeah and he, he was basically he was at purple he was at purple heaven temple they have a buildings below that's kind of a tight uh you know tai chi school the martial arts school he had some of his students running that when I went. And unfortunately, he was not available at that visit. I filmed him later. But he he, he then left. He just, a year later, he left everything. And uh, I filmed him later where he described what he did. You know, he went to live in a cave and he, he had enough, you know. Because he was really, you know, uh, he was really working for the government, local government at right. that time. And it was part of the big plan. It was part of the big plan to put Wudang Mountain on the map yeah. for Kung Fu, for martial arts. It was, you know, they looked at Shaolin and all the money that was pouring in to yeah. those Shaolin monks were driving around in brand new black Audis. Oh, voices. <laughs> yeah, and the Wudang Mountain was jealous. Of course yeah. they were jealous, you know. And um, so it's part of the big plan that, you know, Zhang Yunlong was there to, and he kind of like said, okay, this is too much. And they moved a lot of the schools from the mountain, yeah. you know. I don't know if you're aware of that. When I was going up there, they, because they, you know, they a lot of the schools attracted the wrong kind of people going up the mountain, to, according to the local government, you know. And everything became permitted. You right. had to get stamps. And I was going to Wudang Mountain. You just went there, went up the mountain any way you could. You know, and every then suddenly my assistant Betty. Oh, we have to. Oh, we have to go to the government offices. They built a big, big new, about uh, two miles away from the local city, Wu Shan. They built big government just to run what was happening at at Wu You know, and then suddenly they had crowds, crowds and crowds there. You know, to go up the mountain, because of course. In the in 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 promoting kung fu tourism, they were also promoting the the Taoist temples. Right, right. They, they such a large connection. One can't go without the other at Wu Dang. hopefully it doesn't go one. So it just got harder and harder to go up the mountain. As a film, you know, uh, film uh, we were having to wait in line to go up the peaks and to get to into temple. It was terrible, yeah. and uh, I was very. Um, so, you know, a lot of the good schools moved to the bottom of Wudang Mountain. Yeah. So that's, uh, we filmed, we filmed The Immortal Path was one of our last movies at Wudang. And we filmed almost the entire movie with uh, Song Yul. In fact, let me, this is a, don't know if you ever saw that cover. This is, old, this is how old is 2003? Wow. So this is, you know, over 20, you know. Yeah. And um, we, we just, I'd, I'd done one interview with him already by this. So it was fascinating. I came back with, oh, wow, look, it was on the front cover of, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. magazine. So, um, and that was a great interview. That was really lots of knowledge in there from it. You know. So, yeah, so Wudang, yeah, Wudang Mountain. So, you know, I loved you... the there and I loved going, the trips there, the food was yeah. great, you know, that sort of mountain food, you know, country food. Right. But, um, a very different place today now. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, you know, you, you, you'd you gone to the Shaolin Temple and you'd gone to Wudong before it became sort of like yeah. a, you know, some people refer to these places now as Kung Fu Disneyland. Yeah, sure. 
you know, and it's yeah. probably a huge shock to people from Europe and, and North America when they, you know, go to China to sort of track down things that they've maybe seen in books or, or films. And then when yeah. they, it's, a, it's a very different situation. Yeah. Uh, to the point, so where, you know, like, I don't know if you know who Matthew Polly is, but he, he wrote a book called uh, American Shaolin. He went to the Shaolin Temple, I think. Yeah. Like I, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Before it became so big. Yeah. And he talks about the same type of thing, how everything's sort of like, you know, the government came in and uh, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, took control of everything. And, and you know, yeah. it's become about tourism. Yeah. How do you think that that's just in your experience, because you've been to these places during various times, how do you think that's affected the quality of instruction in places like that? Oh, a great deal, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you you can see some of the what I would call real Shaolin instructors, real the 34th generation of Shaolin monk, which was, you know, uh, Shidi Chen, Shidi Yang, and Shida Ru. Shida Ru now lives in America. Uh, in, he lives in Mobile, Alabama, I believe. Mobile. But she, she is, um, they to me represented the end of the real, you know, real Shaolin, uh, what you would, the real Shaolin monk. They epitomized it. And I was lucky to be able to interview them before it got really, really crazy. Um, and uh, uh, Shidi Yang left the confines of the temple and opened his own school up, uh, which is still there today. It's, uh, you know, not that far away, but, uh, and he supplies some of the students to the temple for the young team. But Shaolin, what happened, uh, uh, the full story that a... A company from uh, from um, Shanghai bought the rights to market Shaolin. That's really what I was informed happened. And in this, the obviously through government permission, and but it this company was a private company, and within months they had these red gates, turnstile gates at the entrance to uh, Shaolin. And I remember turning up, I was like, what the hell is happening here, you know? And uh, yeah, yeah, really incredible. Uh, and they, it was, they, they'd opened shop. There was a hamburger, yeah. to, fast hamburger place at the entrance. It was with the American flag in them. I, I mean, I was just appalled. And buses, they'd opened a park, car park with buses to, for two, Tourists and oh, I was shocked. It all happened within one year. This, uh, you know, uh, my last visit was only a year before, and it was just awful, awful. And um, so that was that, you know. And and um, I was still given full access, but they'd limited access to foreign camera people now because they were they were polishing the image, right. You know, Shaolin image. They were polishing it to a to, to, to and um, so they stopped all these different cameras. We were lucky. I, I took. Um, we were smart in Beijing. We we uh, when we did the original uh, Shaolin kid, we we became friends with all the guides at Shaolin Temple, the ones that they'd been uh, approached by Shanghai. So we went. We would take the guides with us. And of course, the turnstile just opened. We went through with the cameras and everything, you know. But um, still, it, it changed a lot. We we they did um, the significant one was there was a very big celebration to mark a, a period of Shaolin's history, and they were having all the government people from Beijing coming down, and uh, from you know the Communist Party in a, in essentially where a lot of their funding came from and and uh, not just, but they were the ones who also allowed the Shaolin to keep some of the money, you know, and the, the current abbot of Shaolin was rolling in money. They were building a new house next to Shaolin. I could see the cars parked outside, black SUVs, you know, that belonged to it. And I don't know if you, were you ever aware of that New York Times expose on Shaolin? I, I didn't know something about it, yeah. Yeah, the abbot was seen as a that occurred at the time, and uh, and I was outside his house, you know, his accommodation, and I said, yeah, it's probably true, and um, so I feel I was a, we 
it was the one time Shaolin said to me, you can't film this event. There's a lot of communist party people coming who may not want to be on a, you know, on a camera. We don't know what you do with your video. So it leaves China, you know. And uh, I very, I never used to ask my assistant Betty for really big favors once in a while because she was accredited journalist in, from Peak in Beijing, and she had access. She would do, she would cover the Communist Party every four years, the big event. She was allowed to cover that in Beijing. But I finally said, look, you've got to help us here. You've got to go visit the government offices in Den, the local city, Denfeng, and. We need to film this. This is a big event. And we waited and waited outside Shaolin. And she, she came back, big arm bands. And, uh, and I, wow, what, wow, what, you know, she really came through. And, and she did this on a number of occasions. You can't make movies without having someone like that by your side. You know, you, it's impossible. You need local people with power. And with power, especially in China, yeah. they have to have some weight behind them. And she did it. So, and we filmed that. And sure enough, you know, lots of dignitaries and and uh, you know, communist people in with bodyguards and suits, or in this huge parade, which I I put into the Shaolin Kid movie. I, I believe it's all there. And so, yeah, you need you need people, and it's changed. It's really changed now, Shaolin. It's I I haven't been there for about five years. I don't want to go back there. Yeah. And unfortunately, Wudang Mountain has fallen into the same trap yeah. because now you go to Wudang Mountain. There's they built a huge university. I was there. I filmed inside this university, and I said, "This is enormous." Oh, this is just the first part we're building. We ten thousand dormitories. To t it's a kung fu school, and it's at the entrance to uh, Wudang Mountain. And they're building they're building five star hotels, and and the uh, the crowds were just, oh my goodness, yeah. Just... I had a friend who uh, went for the they had like a six hundredth anniversary of there being you know temples on the mountain, and he said mm. that they constructed a um, artificial waterfall. So they mm. got the background for when they filmed it and had all these lights and things up like that. He was very de depressed about it and said something yeah. to one of the local people about it. And they, they were like, well, you know, they said that the, probably the original Taoist tournaments on this mountain were probably upset when they built temples here instead of just meditating in caves. But I've just never understood that mentality. I've been to countries before where you go and see some like beautiful, you know, natural place. Then you go back a few years later and they've built like a visitor center there, you yeah. know, to explain to yeah. you what you're looking at. And I've just, I've never understood it. Yeah, and they've built roads and they've got buses running through what were, you know, beautiful temples of, uh, you know, grounds. But, and, and isn't Taoism, aren't you supposed to never touch? Yeah, yeah. Remain nature. things, you know, nature. And yeah. so they they are uh, just kung, kung fu tourism. You know, that's simple as that. You know, they wanted to compete with uh, Shaolin. And I think they they really are overtaking them because yeah. they've got a more natural, beautiful area with the pit mountains and the peaks, and it's a little warmer, more south, you know. So, uh, and 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 you know what's interesting is Chem Village is a place I visited many times, you know, which is in the middle of nowhere, uh, in the countryside, and we talk. I talked about this with Shen, uh, Chen Shawang, uh, one of the, you know, the sort of patriarchal head of the Chen family. And he said, well, you know, we we could be heading that way. Yeah. Really? It says, look, because we're four, maybe five hours drive from Shaolin Temple. It takes about five hours to drive to Shaolin Temple, maybe six hours. We did the drive a couple of times. And he said, look, Shaolin Temple is not far away. And people come to Chen Village and see, you know, we have a, they had a you know, nice school with, with accommodation, but nothing like, you know, the, what was happening at Shaolin, you know. And people at Chen Village, although it's Tai Chi, it's what I would call on the hard side. They were doing Kung Fu. Yeah, you know, they were 
literally teaching uh, Shaolin style Kung Fu, uh, also weapons and everything, you know, sword and stuff. So it's kind of interesting. But I did like Chen Village, and I hope it really doesn't go that way. You know, I don't think it will because I don't think the village where it's located could support tourism. It, it's just, you know, really poor area. Yeah, in the middle of nowhere, nothing there. Nothing there, no, really poor, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so, but it, it's kind of sad what's happening with, but it's, you know, it's what, it's what is happening, you right. know, unfortunately, um, not so much in Japan, uh, but because it's a very different culture in Japan, but e even so, we're losing. In Japan, they don't promote anything, uh, you know, as a sort of a, tourist effect but but uh you know they, they but it's it's happening in japan i i talk to some friends in japan you know all the time and uh sad it seems so, to be traditional chinese martial arts yeah. yeah it seems to be inevitable in a way but um i i wonder sometimes if you know for a long time you know uh, the the best like especially i guess with chinese martial arts you know you had a much better chance of finding a Chinese martial arts teacher who would teach you as a um, non-Chinese person in some place like, you know, New York City or San Francisco than you than you would in China. You know what I mean? Like yeah. before China opened back up somewhat. Yeah. So I wonder if now maybe things are just spreading out more and becoming more decentralized. Um, there might, I don't know, in some cases there might be better teachers living outside of China. I don't know. I don't want to yeah. say, but, you know, more available, I guess. Yeah. So, well, I mean, a, a number of Wudang teachers are living in America now, yeah. You know, so I, I know that, especially you know, around California area and places, and earning very good, you know, sizable incomes. I think now, you know, teaching Wudang Tai Chi, uh, and um, you know, it's happened with uh, two or three members of the Chen Village family are also, yeah. and especially Shaolin. You know, they've lost a number of people, and they've tried to open Shaolin temples in in America, but I'm not sure how well they're doing, you know, because yeah. officially they've got to promote Buddhism because they're, they're non-profit charities, you know? Right. <laughs> but it's interesting. It's interesting. But While, um, you're, while you're traveling and doing these films, um, you know, you're a martial artist. You've been a martial yeah. artist since a teenager. Did you get to yeah. train? Did you get to train in these arts? Not, not, not too much, no. And in fact, interesting you asked that. I, I really kept it quiet especially in Japan, that yeah. I was uh, so interested. They would guess because they said, you must be a karate, yeah. you know, background because your questions, are, you know, because, you know, you want to really want them to open up. If they automatically, oh, you know, he's, you know, they've got this background, and you know. So I, I kind of try to be uh, neutral, neutral. And so I, I really... Once in a while, some my assistants were all martial arts people, yeah, and they would sometimes train, and they would end up in uh, in the movies. Betty was not a martial arts girl though, by any means, uh, but um, so no, no, I never did uh, get that involved, you know. But you know, today, I mean, you know, I'm teaching karate today. You know, I'm at the dojo teaching four classes, at, uh, you know, Monday to Friday. And mostly Okinawa and Gojiro now, which is interesting because I came from a very hard Shaolin, uh, uh, Shodokan karate background, you know, yeah. tough power, speed, you know, yeah. which has changed a little. And I, as I said, I used to do martial arts mainly because of the instructors you meet, senses. And I remember in, in England, I switched to uh, Wadaru style through meeting uh, Suzuki Sensei, Tatsu Suzuki Sensei, who was, uh, you know, one of the founding uh, people behind Wadaru in Japan. He was a fantastic instructor. And I remember the first time training with him and he would come up and he, he would hit my head, body and go, wood, like wood. Because he was, he married an English woman, but his English was not that good, but he, he, like wood, wood, meaning, you know, be so. soft relaxed and and it was the first time I did karate that had the softness attached to it be gentle be no no tension relax relax they kept saying wood you're like wood 
you know, kept it, you know, which was interesting. And uh, and I felt it changed my karate quite a bit. And then by the time I I got, I would move to America and I was training here, mainly with Shotokan dojos again. They saw that I was, uh, my speed, I was quick for my age, fast and relaxed, relaxed. And they, they were like, wow, you know, this is interesting, you know. And then, you know, we just tense up at the very split, at the very end. You know? And I think karate's changed over time. I think um, I, I, I'm no, no idea what what's influencing it so strong, but I, I'm I I like many of the aspects of Shotokan karate, but I'm I'm more interested now in the Okinawans, especially Gojira, which has this kind of soft side to it, hard style, softness involved. You know, different. You know, you know. It's interesting because when you when you get a, a punch or a kick and you block in Japan, this blocking, this uki. Well, in reality, you know, in Shodokan, we, we were told block, break his, break his arm, break it, you know. But in reality, the, the uki is to receive. It's the, the the original translation of that word is, you know, to receive, right? Not not block, almost like receiving a gift. And uh, in in Gojuru, they they show that in their you know, technique, it's, they, you know, you, and it, and it, and it echoes the Chinese martial arts. So of redirecting the force, you know, just redirect, don't, don't block it. Don't, you know, try to, you know, go straight down, you know, but redirect it, you know, and a lot of the techniques in Gojiro, uh, are stick to that principle and it. it's really nice. So yeah, you went I've enjoy. always felt like you can see the connection between like, a. Chinese martial arts, especially like Fujian era uh, or area yeah. martial arts in uh, Goju Ru Karate, you can see yeah. the more more circular motions, softer motions. Absolutely, yeah. So I I visited Fujian province. Um, it was interesting to film martial arts, and never never got to make the movie. No. I got sidetracked and ended up with a completely different movie. Very inter in Fujian mountains, yeah. They had this um, old people. The, the Fujian area, they have these uh, communities that live in these circular buildings. Yeah, the Hakka people, right? Yeah, yeah the Hakka. And they're building the Talus. And I ended up making a movie about the Hakka communities. That's fascinating. The... Yeah, that's incredible. Instead of the, instead of martial arts, I just got completely sidetracked. And the, I, I, I released the movie. It's called the Last Clan. Last Clan, and, yeah. I've not seen it, but I would like to see no, that. And it's all about the Hakka community in uh, Fujian. But yeah, the, the, definitely, you see it in Okinawa. The, the huge, uh, even today, influence, and uh, you know the book and the, the Bubishi, you know, had a, as a enormous came from. Uh, I'm sure the original documents were written. You know, there's very little written. In Chinese martial arts, you know, they, they this is one of the problems. I, I've talked about this a lot, the origin of Tai Chi. Well, where did Tai Chi be? Well, there's nothing written. Right. You know, they, there's no scrolls, ancient scrolls, or you know, that says, oh, look, 12th century, we have Tai Chi, you know, some feng is here, you know, on the mountain. Right. Nothing's yeah. written. Uh, and I, that's one of the things... That, we looked at and I and I came away and I I went to Wudai Mountain and said, can, can I find the answer? And no, it was just stories, you know, just stories. Yeah. Oh. So, so tradition, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just legends and stories and things, you know, which is okay. That's nice. Uh but yeah, so it's the same, you know, this transmission of you know from China to Okinawa is pretty interesting. And it it was now you see it written down, you know, because I think that was the Japanese. And well, let's write this down, you know, let's document right. this, you know. Uh, whereas, you know, in China's everything's nothing's really written down very well, you know. And um, so yeah, I like I visited Okinawa a number of times and uh, to the you know, Gojuru dojos and everybody where you know, Higoano dojo, especially, you know, a great karate master.
How, how would you say the health of the martial arts community is in Japan? And by health, I mean, how robust is the interest in the community in Japan versus in China amongst young people? Do you think that young people in Japan are more interested in martial arts than they are in China? Wow, that's a good question. Ooh. Uh, if I talk about just Japan for the moment, it's in it's in a terrible, terrible, dire situation. Yeah. Dire. Yeah. I, I talk to, I have very good friends in Japan. Alex Bennett is probably the, the most highly ranked uh, and most knowledgeable person in Japan on Japanese martial arts. He's a seventh degree uh, kendo. He's on the his head. He's up. He's in the. He's a, one of the directors of the Budo Association at the at the uh, you know Buddha camp. He, he's head of the uh, Naginata Association. Uh, for, you know, and they use him. They use him really to promote traditional Budo outside Japan. Is what they're using Alex for. He's very knowledgeable. And he talks about this quite a lot, you know, this uh, sort of exporting Budo. Because without exporting the martial arts outside Japan, and I think China's worried about this, the, yeah. it, it will die. It will. Yeah. It, if you look at Japan now, it's the foreigners who are, pro who are propping it up, supporting it. Yeah. And they've and Japanese have only just started to really understand the significance of this. You know that um, that the Japanese, the Japanese young people in Japan, are not going to the traditional karate dojos, especially karate, because karate was always what I would call a lower tier martial art in Japan. You know, it was kind of brutish. The Japanese are very elegant, sensitive. You know. Karate was a little brutish, you know. Yeah. To, um, the sword is everything, you know. Wow. The sword, of Japan. so swordsmanship and especially archery are considered the premier, you know, martial arts. And I think they are so heavily tied into the culture, the samurai, that they are doing okay. Yeah, no kendo and kyud. In fact, archery is almost going through a renaissance. It's really yeah. strange. Uh, yeah, and. I have a very big following on YouTube, so I, I can gauge when I put a video on YouTube what's happening. You know, I have uh, over a half a million subscribers on YouTube. It's, it's quite uh, quite formidable for, you know, uh, film, uh, for uh, martial arts. And the Kudo are always at the top of the really? people. Millions and millions Never of viewers. Never guess that, yeah. Millions and millions of views. Incredible. And, you know, and that's the situation. It's very strange. It, it's almost impossible to uh, predict what's mm -hmm. going to happen. Because when I see, if you if I put a karate video up there, it's not going to reach those heights whatsoever. Whatsoever. Right. You know, not unless you mention samurai or something. And then, oh, you know. But it, it's the same with Kung Fu. It's the same with Chinese martial arts, you know. Um, very difficult to get people interested in Tai Chi, for instance, too slow, not dynamic enough, hard to understand. Where's the fighting aspect they want to ask? You know, they ask the most ludicrous questions on YouTube, you know, you know, yeah, it, it is, it gets tiresome. And, you know, it's like we, we talked it's about a little bit at the beginning about how the, you know, yes, these are fighting arts and obviously, you know, they can work or else they wouldn't still be in existence after hundreds of yeah. years. Yeah. But the value in them is in other other things like Tai Chi, for instance. Uh, you may not ever get attacked by a mugger, but you're going to have to deal with high blood pressure and other things like that yeah. as you age. Mm -hmm. Tai Chi can help you with that. Help absolutely. Yeah, and I just think people just don't they <laughs> they don't think about those sorts of things. No, no. I remember. I mean, one of the great uh, martial arts uh, Japanese karate instructors was Kanazawa Hiroku Kanazawa. It was you know. Uh, incredible and he he had probably oh i think he had about 1.5 million shodokan follow but i i met him on a number of occasions and i remember going out on his 74th birthday uh he was in america and we started talking about tai chi and he was a very big tai chi follower did tai chi every right. day hmm. did the breathing exercises chi gun he was and he said it's it's the flip side of the coin has to be 
he said, you know, Tai Chi, I love Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. And I've met that with a number of what you would call, especially Japanese, you know. Uh, so I do Tai Chi now on a Monday morning. I'll be here in my main beach outside. We, we have a Japanese instructor and he teaches Tai Chi class for, it's really more Qigong, but but it, it's really nice, really nice. But I think it's it has to be incorporated somehow into everybody's martial arts training. I agree. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's the yin and yang. You have to have balance, you yeah. know, balance. Yeah. I talk about it in, in, in my karate classes. You know, we talk about it quite a lot, you know, to explain how, how you should be and, and in combat, you know, in combat, you know. It's, yeah, so, yeah. It's an interesting aspect, this incorporation. I think it it all called, comes down to, you know, it it's all the same. You know, we used to talk about this a lot, especially if you talk to Japanese masters, they always have this vision of the bottom of the mountain. Well, you have all these different styles, right. you know, at the bottom. And as they're climbing to the top and you get better and better, you become a master. Well, at the very point, it's all one. Right, you know? absolutely. absolutely. It's all one. Yeah. So this this is what I this is my philosophy. It's it really is all one, you know, especially having been all over Asia to, you know, the Philippines, for example, was yeah. a great trip. You know, I'm very big promoter of Filipino martial arts. You know, it's really nice, you know. And again, it's it's just part of it's one piece. You know, it's not so different. It's just one piece martial art. Yeah, absolutely. They're all they're all connected for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what are your future plans? Do you have any future plans for filmmaking? And now you're in Miami and you're you're teaching karate, but um, yeah, no. Unfortunately, COVID had a dramatic dramatic uh, effect. You know, uh, I was halfway through a movie in China when COVID hit. In fact, I got out. I was, I, I was there. I left in November and then COVID hit the America in February or the, the news came to America in early February about Wuhan and everything, you know, and I used to go through Wuhan quite a bit to go down to, uh, you know, Wudan mountain and stuff and uh, Chen village. I would go through Wuhan. And so I had a heart, I had half a movie made on Bagua and Shingi. Wow. Right. And yeah, that we were filming around Beijing because a lot of the really good people for Xingyi around Beijing. So, and, um, you know, we ended up waited a year after COVID and then just this whole vibration, the good, it didn't feel good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, going back to China so early because everybody was upset with COVID. So I ended up edited it into a 30 minute movie and put it onto YouTube for free. <laughs> Just said, let's, okay. And then I made a movie uh, with Shirinji Kempo in Japan. I'm not sure if you know that martial art very well, no, but it's Shirinji kind is like of a Shaolin sort of version. Very, very much Chinese roots yes, right. with the, you know, Doshin So yeah. who you know, was in China during the Second World War and uh, his teacher was a Shaolin uh, temple instructor. So, yeah. So we, we, they, I did a movie a long time ago for Shirinji Kempo, which was a real nightmare to, to get done because I, I did a Warriors of Budo, which was highlighting all the aspects of China, Japanese martial arts from number one to number seven, uh, the seven Budo, you know, uh, 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 and uh, Shirinji Kempo was going to be number three, I, I believe. It was going to be karate, you know, uh, Aikido, Judo, Kendo, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they said, no, we sorry. I went to visit them. I, they have an office in Tokyo. And they said, sorry, you can't film. And, and I said, is there a big reason? They said, yes. It's uh, a somewhat slightly difficult reason to tell you but we're going through a period that we have to change our branding because they use the nazi swastika ah uh, yeah so the old 
That was their symbol. Yeah. And he said, look, it's going to take about two years to remove this through it because it's on everything. It's mm -hmm. on the karate dot unit. It's all over our building in our headquarters in um, Japan. And anyway, so I waited. And in fact, we ended up where we moved all the episodes around. And Shirinji Kembo became the seventh at the end. And um, so they allowed me to. And I went back to their headquarters and filmed it. There was some remnants of, but I did that of the, you know, swastika. Because it is used. It's a symbol of, you know. Yeah, it's an ancient Buddhist, symbol. Yeah. yeah, ancient symbol. But unfortunately, the Nazi regime had, you know, stole it. Right. And um, so, but they had, and I did ask, uh, Doshin So's um, daughter is the head of Shirinji Kampa. So she was quite nice to tell me why they did this. And, you know, I asked her all about the change of the brand and everything, you know. And so then... That's a long story because I did that about 10 or 12 years ago. And then Shirinji Kenpo approached me sort of to make a documentary on this. So obviously they liked the first one I made, right. which was in the episode. So um, they came out, would you like to do it? It's our 70th anniversary, you know? So I said, yeah, okay, let's let's do that or whatever. Our 72nd anniversary, I can't remember. And so I did a documentary. That was the last one we did with Shirinji, main documentary. We've done small, short ones ever since. Right now, I mean, I'm almost 70 years old, so I'm not sure I've got the energy. It's, it's pretty, you know, tough get, going up those mountains. You yeah, know, and, you're timing you know. as well, I imagine. Yeah, and it, yeah, you know, it, it's it's a two-year situation. You don't, you know, you're filming, you have to get the right weather. Then, you know, one of my big uh, rules about making a documentary was I, I don't want number two. I want to interview the number one. Right. And if I can't get the head, I'll wait. If I can't get the top, I'll wait. You know, let's wait. And so sometimes you would start a, a, a movie and then suddenly find that the one you want to interview is unavailable or they can't do it or so so you have to wait and you wait and wait you know yeah and so that caused a lot of problems the situation scheduling so yeah it can take two years of your time for one yeah. movie i just thought could i go through that i don't know <laughs> maybe something interesting will present itself in the near future let's see what happens um i i really enjoy your films i'm i know everybody Thank you. Thank you. They are, like I said, a really important contribution to martial arts because they are very um, unsensationalized um, mm. and accurate, you know, yeah. you, um, and, and there's not a lot of that in the martial arts uh, documentary no. world to this day. No. And, and, you know, what? it's interesting you say that because I have had people. There's a, There was a karate instructor, Yohara, Yohara sent me, Kyo Yohara sent, kind of slightly sensationalized by the way he teaches. Mm -hmm. He was a JKA instructor, uh, fantastic martial arts, but pretty tough. He had this kind of uh, sort of, how can we say, he was linked to the Yakuza, the gangster. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. you know, you've heard the stories. Yeah. Apparently, you know, one legend was he, he entered a championship when he was young and he had knife wounds still it, he taped them up and he was at the Budokan in the Japan championships with knife wounds, you know, in the side of him after a gang fight, you know. So he had all these famous, you know. And I decided, you know, I want to include you, Harry. I want to go see him, you know. And he, he was uh, thrown out of the JKA when he was young for his uh, tough attitude. But he, he was very humble. He was fantastic. I, I found him just such a nice person, not like what you thought, you know. And we filmed at his dojo, a class. And uh, it was interesting. When we did the interview with them, we got back uh, that evening at the hotel and the audio was awful. Wow, and, uh, wow. terrible. I was, my assistant, I wouldn't blame my assistant, but he, he apologized because it, it switched off the wrong uh, audio button on the, on the, we used to film audio separately to the right. camera. It was a separate audio switch. 
And I said, oh boy. And and he said, I'm not going back to your house. He was scared to death of your house, you know. Yeah. I'm not gonna, what are you gonna do? I said, let's get in touch. Let's get in touch. Let's go there in the morning. And, and I said to him straight, look, I don't wanna use poor audio. Will you do the interview again? He, yeah, absolutely. I says, because he realized I wanted great. I said, I don't want to use poor audio. Right. And he said, do you want me to put my karate uniform gi on it? Yeah, uh, great. He said, do it now. And we did it right there, you know, in the, yeah, sure. And he went, changed, came back into outside the dojo and did the interview. So he was very humble. But the one thing, um, going back to your point about uh, the way we filmed, uh, that it we, we didn't want to sensationalize too much. He did contact me about a few months later when the movie was released. And he said, I'd like to thank you because no one ever filmed our dojo like you did. You you seem to point the camera at exactly where it should be, you know, uh, and seem to understand what was happening there. Obviously, it was my karate background, my martial arts background, but he wasn't the first person to say that. And I said, thank you so much. You know, for the for the instructors to come back and say, you you really, you know, film correctly. Yeah. Instead of complaining. Right. You know, you took out the bits, you'd only showed the, you know, yeah. the incorrect parts, you know. So yeah. that's the one thing that we follow this principle of uh, you know, let's show the classes how they really are. Yeah. I want someone to watch one of our documentaries and, and say, Okay, I want to go to, you know, yeah. Japan. Even Wudang Wu, Wu Mountain and Shaolin. Uh, if you look at some of our, we put in some of the bad parts. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I was, I didn't shy away. I, I think we made a documentary in Shaolin and, and I showed some really awful situation where they had fake monks being selling photos. They would, yeah. you know, and I put that in the video. I said, look what's happening here. You know, it's awful. And the same with Wudang, I showed pictures and I said, look, they built this big universe, we've got bus, buses now, you have to get tickets, uh, you have to go to, you know, it's awful. You know, so I, I didn't shy away from that. You've, and I think, you know, people who like the movies, are you deserve to do that. You, it's your responsibility not to show something which is not true. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. We yeah. need that kind of honest representation. <laughs> you spent... Yeah. A good chunk of your life, you know, making these films. Um, mm. What What do you think is the future? Or what, let me ask: What do you think that these martial arts, these older traditional martial arts, have to offer people in the twenty first century? Yeah, Ooh, that is a what well, probably I think the the most difficult question right now, and it's a question we have to address. You know, we have to talk about it um, because I don't think there's one simple answer. You know, we, we we don't want to lose this history, you know, we and I think Japan's understanding that they they realize that you know Japan by itself cannot rescue what's happening. You know, uh Naginata, for example, a martial art in Japan, which has an incredible history. You know, the samurai wives used to train in Naginata and things like this. And I've filmed Naginata instruction. It's predominantly a woman's martial art in Japan, but it's it's disappearing, disappearing. Uh, nobody, you, you know, who, Naginata, what's that? You know, people, and I filmed uh, Jukendo, Tankendo. Jukendo, it's the rifle bit. Yeah, yeah. But, and I filmed Jukendo, I went to a seminar, and uh, the instructor, 92 years old, well, he was from the Second World War, Japanese, and he, 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 he remembers... You know, uh, the, the, the U.S. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, taking over uh, uh, Japan for the next 10 or 15 years in Japan. You know, the occupation, the, you know, allied occupation of Japan, where martial arts was banned, prohibited. Right. Because the very word Bushido was right. prohibited. You know, you could not mention that word. And so these are these are disappearing. You know, I have a very good friend of mine who's in, in, he's an artist and he's in Tokyo and he's a fifth degree down in uh, Jukendo. Wow. But it, it's disappearing. Right. Disappearing. And um, 
He's, there's no there's no class for him to go to now. And he attended, I don't know if you've heard of the, uh, in, you know, the International Budo University in uh, Japan. He was there for seven years uh, when he first went to Japan. So many foreigners start at the International Budo University, the IBU. And um, he said, there's no class now for me to attend in Jukendo anymore. Uh, there's just a one year seminar. And each year, more people have passed away got the old the old guard and it and there's hardly any young people so it's going to fade away and i think um you know this is happening everywhere you know china also you know and you see some martial arts rising up you know uh, filipino arnis is is one very becoming very pop went through a phase wing chun right. you know went through a really big boom, obviously because of it, man, right. you know, and we did a Wing Chun movie and yeah, we we kind of like, we're riding that same wave because yeah. I have to make money as a filmmaker. So we said, okay, let's, but we made a Wing Chun movie, which we thought was, you know, told the truth, you know, and, um, you know, we filmed the Wing Chun places in Hong Kong. We went out to Fo Shan to, you know, it man's uh, original home and went to his, first Wing Chun uh, studio there. So, but it, it, so you get these martial arts, which ride a wave. Now the Wing Chun, it, it's died down. You know, everybody's a little bit tired of Wing Chun. It, and they've got, they don't last. Yeah. They don't have the legs to survive. Wing Chun, you know, it's, it's only as good as the next, you know, it man number six. Right. Is, yeah. You know, right. no, no, no audience anymore. And, um, so you, you, that's happening more and more, you know. Right now, there's a wave of j traditional Japanese martial arts. There's a wave happening right now. It started with The Last Samurai, yeah. you know, uh, uh, which was uh, pretty good for swordsmanship. People were interested again, you know, and things like this. And uh, now we've got the Shogun, yeah, you know. Yeah, the Shogun. It looks great. Yeah, it does. I'm a big fan of the original show oh, and series I am too. Yeah. from the eighties. Yeah, so oh, it about it very time. well. So I think, and and people say to me, "Well, do you think the last samurai was uh, on this depiction?" No, of course not. That's you know, eighteen sixty eight. You know, this didn't really happen. You know, the last samurai didn't happen like this, and all this kind of thing. But we need it. Yeah. You know, we we want. The Last Samurai. I was in uh, Japan when Last Samurai premiered, and yeah. I came out of Shibuya Station, and the there's a department store across the street, really big department store, and the entire building had a Tom, Tom Cruise, <laughs> yeah. you know, with his sword. And, and I, this is wonderful. Yeah. You know, people said, what do you think? To, I said, this is fantastic. It's the only way we're going to stop Traditional martial arts being lost, we have to do this, you know. Um, 47 Ronin was another movie that I was disappointed. It was nothing like the actual reality, you know, unfortunately. But I think the Shogun will be good because they, I, I've seen the behind the scenes, uh, what was up, and they really going to great lengths to be true to the, to the time period, yeah. you know. And so I think I'm really looking for, in fact, we, I've organized the party on the 27th of this month to watch the first episode, you know, and I'm looking uh, forward to it myself. I, I think yeah. you can hit the nail on the head there. You know, it ties in nicely with, with the whole subject of the interview is that, you know, and it, we've come to a point where we're sort of dependent on films to keep yeah. parts alive. Yeah, it's true. Where because, we're at. Yeah. Because if you put, uh, a book in front of someone they're not going to read a, a thousand page book on uh anymore you know i've got a library here i've got books oh my goodness you know there's a book on on tai chi I, have you ever seen the, let me just can i just show you this book yeah, absolutely do you know about this book i was given this book by chen sha Wan. i don't have that no it's the canon of Chen, Chen Tai Chi. And you can yeah. see that. 
And I, I carried this around with me for about eight months in China. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's incredible. No, but it's in English, which is, yeah. which is yeah. the, the incredible part, right? Yeah. Because they actually said, and I said, how did you do this? Massive, massive book in English. And they said, well, it's, it's to save Chen Tai Chi. They know that yeah. without this, kind, but nobody's going to, yeah. Who's going to read this, you know? Yeah. They're going to watch my one-hour movie on Chen Village right. called Chen right. Village, you know? Unfortunately, I'm saying that because yeah. I would love them to read this book yeah. to save, you know, Chen Tai Chi, um, to stop them going through the tourist aspect, like Shaolin Temple, you know? Uh, let's save the martial arts. But you're right. It's, you know, they're they're watching YouTube, you yeah. know? And YouTube is getting more and more ridiculous. You know, the, the sensationalism of martial arts is, is through the roof, you know. So that's a sad aspect, you know. And, you know, I have over half a million followers on YouTube. And some of the questions just show the ignorance. You know, it's absolutely uh, appalling. Yeah. The, the, these kids. And you, you can tell what age they, I mean, I can say straight away, well, he's 15 years old kid. He's never even, you know, been outside his home, you know, home hometown. And then that's not to be negative, but it's to be, look, if you're going to ask the question, make it a good question, you know, right. make it not like, you know, you know, you know, this would not work in MMA, you know, <laughs> Paul, that's the first question they ask, no matter right. what martial yeah. art. It's all it's cut and paste. Yeah. You know. And it's the same with MMAs. I did a movie with uh, the finalist of the UFC, you know, a long time, 10 years ago. Fighter's uh, Journey. Fighter's Journey. It was very interesting. He was to me, he wouldn't he uh, an interesting guy, Jonathan Brookens. He was a very educated, he educated himself, came from the slums, you know. He lived in a trailer park in Tennessee, yeah. and he won the U UFC, and he, he was burnt out, you know, burnt out, because the, the way they, it's organized, you know, pushing, 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 and, and the way it's run, and it, it's a, a training academy, the money was flowing in, the television rights were going through the roof, you know, the money, 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 pushing it, it's like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, so I we went to India, he needed to go detox he was on drugs. Yeah, you know, he was smoking pot. He was on pills all through his UFC career, uh, and no one discusses that. He told me, he says, no one talks about it. It's a, it's a hidden secret. They, no one discusses it because they get burnt out. And um, I took, we went to India, and you know, and through a series of interviews, wanted to find out what it's like to, you know, to be a you know, UFC fighter. And today, you know, I would not make an, I would not be able to make a movie like that anymore. They would, you know, the UFC would start me, MMA, or, you know, oh, no, you can't go there. The fighters are prized, prized performers in a ring, you yeah. know? And so we're on a, we're on a Brazilian jiu-jitsu wave. Will it end? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It's got, it, you know, we'll die out and we'll get, we'll, you know, get the next one coming up, you know? Could it be Tai Chi? I think possibly, I think, you know, we it could happen. I think yeah. people are looking more at wellness, health and wellness than they did before, that when you get sick, it's far too expensive in some of these countries to get well, yeah. you know? Uh, I'm sorry, but what country. country are we? Are you in America? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I don't even, you know. Very, very expensive to get well here. Yeah, for sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it's dreadful. Uh, I and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Brit, so I talk about healthcare, you know, the aspect. I mean, you know, look, the healthcare in England's not uh, fantastic, but it it is still free. Yeah, and, you have your NHS yeah. there. There's nothing like that here. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. NHS. I'm a NHS baby, you know, without that, you know, but I never got sick. I've never been sick my entire life. And I put that down to martial arts for sure. You know, never being ill, uh, never even affected me so far. 
you know, and I'm 70 this year. But uh, I think that's why I think we'll see it. I think we'll see, you know, martial art, not so much, you know, breathing aspects of martial arts and charity leads the field in this kind of, you know, balancing one's life, you know, and health and wellness. We did a movie on uh, the natural way on ch traditional Chinese medicine, you know, and um, a lot related to, you know, the internal Chinese arts. Yeah, absolutely. Same side of the coin, right. totally. You know, yeah. And that was fascinating too. And I think that could, if they took that aspect of Chinese martial arts, the health wellness aspect, the, the, the longevity that we need, you know, could could work. I think yeah. we could, in a very slow way, infiltrate people's homes, you know. Yeah. The problem in America is it's a quick fix thing. They, you know, they want they want it to happen in a few hours. Oh, I got sick. What do I do now? You know, can I do it on a Saturday morning? Yeah. Go to work on Monday? Well, not really. It's a lifestyle change. Right. We're talking about, right. You know, that's, that's the problem in America because they're just so life. used to taking drugs, and you know, be ready for work on a Monday. That doesn't work with you. It's you know. Num it's prevention is what you need and Tai Chi is the answer convinced of it. if if I don't I only I do Tai Chi once a week it's not enough but unfortunately the teacher I'm not going to I have no credentials to teach Tai Chi but um the teacher can only do Monday morning so I say I and I'm still working so Monday morning is a tough tough yeah. call yeah. uh to, to to do Tai Chi when you've got all these emails coming in and people calling but Everybody knows where I will be. And and I and I um a couple of weeks ago we had a severe storm and I missed the class. We know the class was cancelled. Even though I invited everybody to go to the my karate dojo, let's I'll open the dojo. It's too late. Everybody's, you know, gone home. And I the effect of missing that one class on Tai Chi was really upset my balance for that week. Yeah. Do, yeah. It was really strange. I know that a karate class wouldn't do that to me. That's but that Tai Chi class did. You know, really, I really missed that one class, and uh, rely on it now. And I want to do more. Keep because as I'm older, I think it has an even greater effect on me. I think when you're young, and and you're uh, you have this really high energy sort of uh, situation going on. You know your hormones and everything. And you've you know you you. It's it maybe doesn't have that effect. I did tai, I started Tai Chi when I was twenty one, just after getting. And the difference between I I I spent really twelve months of hard training to get my black belt. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, never missing. We were going for barefoot runs at the weekends for five miles through the snow. You know, yeah. and then I stopped. Boom. I started doing Tai Chi with a great instructor and did Tai Chi for 18 months with no karate. And I was too young at that time. That's what I discovered much later. Too young. I returned to karate because I was too, you know, just didn't have, my body wasn't appreciating what Tai Chi was doing to it, I, I feel. Because I think when you're very young, you have this you're impervious you 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 have a resilience yeah. you know you you know you don't you're not getting sick right. you know you can miss a night's sleep you still feel okay right. you know and and the tai chi was having no effect on me and we were doing pushing hands and some martial arts a little bit aspects you know but uh i i i i left tai chi. but now i've returned this last few years it has a much bigger effect on my body. Yeah. And my mind. Yeah. Because, and you appreciate that effect more as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so I think that's where I, I think we could see a resurgence in. I think we really see a strong resurgence in Chinese martial arts, not Wing Chun this time, but, you know, something much slower, much more to be appreciated. And I think tied into the problems we've got with healthcare in the world. Yeah. You know, people are just simply, you know, not looking after themselves and you know and don't know how to the, even if they even if they could or you know if they wanted to they, they're not sure how to go about it so I, i'm hoping that that yeah. will 
I'm hoping that will be, you know, one of the, the keys to preserving these things is that people will realize their, their actual value for self-preservation. Yeah, I think what they've got to do is, and there is, a, there is actually this happening right now where people are saying, look, we're all working too hard. Yeah. yeah. You know, people are, stop working seven days a week, stop working five days a week, let's cut back to four, change our lifestyle. And so there's this thing with slowing it all down, you know. Slow it all down. We've it got too carried away. The planet's getting hurt. Everything's hurting. Everything's hurting, you know. And I think this was what will help that if we look at that, because people have to find time to do this kind. Of, you know, Tai Chi doesn't happen overnight, as you know, you know, and um, it's a slow process. But it's not too late you, to learn Tai Chi, you know, and uh, oh, any of the great arts that are out there, you know, Dao Yin, yeah. you know, the, the Dao Yin is, but there's a, there's a lack of good teachers. We need to find the teachers, get them over here, get them into America, good teachers and support them, Yeah, you know, support them, you know, and uh, I think we could see that. I, I'm optimistic. Certain things I'm definitely not optimistic about. We're going to lose them for sure. You know, we're losing some now. I we, I was talking about this the other day in my karate dojo. One of my black belts um, is like an assistant, was using the tumfa. You know, mm -hmm. and I and he said to me, "Do you teach the tumfa?" And I said, "No, not anymore. No one. Every time I said I was going to do, no one turned up because they don't see." Uh, any use right you don't you know you're not going to walk down the street with tom far right. you know this, if anybody watching this doesn't yeah. know what a tom far just google you know okinawan weapon and the same with a lot of okinawan weapons yeah. you know they're slowly fading away because even the foreigners can't support them enough yeah. you know there's a lack of good teachers to teach you know some of the you know, okinawan kabudo the weapons so it's sad, but you know, I you know, if 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 I don't have the the, the students coming, and I I have nothing, you know, I have no that's one. the problem. No one to teach. Yeah. So some of them are definitely, I think, are going to suffer. Some of the those, you know, and uh, same in China, Okinawa, Japan, it's, they're all suffering to a certain extent. You know, it's sad, but it's. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to preserve some of the more, you know, usable aspects. But yeah, unfortunately, John, we're just about out of time. Um, well, we enjoyed like, it. Uh, it was a great conversation. It was great to be able to talk to you and get some insight into all of this. Um, could you uh, tell people where they can find you at? We'll also well, include... yeah. start with the website because we I'm, I still post uh, on the blog and everything. We, I try to do at least one good post a week with a couple of thousand words. It's emptymindfilms.com, all one word. Uh, YouTube slash emptymindfilms.com. We're, we're, I, I have no idea about Facebook and Instagram. Now, my wife looks after my social media. I haven't been to Facebook in years. Um, I don't blame you. So I, I've never been to Instagram, believe it or not. So that's kind of weird, I know, but my wife looks after. The thing is with Instagram, it's all on the mobile phone. Uh, yeah. and, and I just really can't, you know, trying to look at martial arts on a phone, this, you know. No. So, but YouTube is fine. I'm, I I sometimes ask answer questions on YouTube if they're not too bad, you know. So Fantastic. yeah, empty mind films. Emptymindfilms.com, John Braley. John, thank you so much for taking time out to talk to me today. Um, I thank really you, Thank you.